My text tonight is from Romans 8, 26 and 27. There are several translations of this verse, as you can well imagine. I'm, trying to, I'm giving you a translation that is sort of a composite of what I understand the original text to say. And as I read this text, I believe it says, likewise, or in the same manner. That immediately raises the question, in what manner? I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> likewise, the Spirit himself helps our weakness. It's rather interesting the word weakness is singular. I don't care what you find in your translations, it's singular. <laughs> it seems to describe our general condition rather than some of our individual deficiencies. We all have the same disease, it's a weakness. Likewise, the Spirit himself helps our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray according to God. That is in harmony with God. But, and the word but is very strong. <laughs> the Spirit, him, though we don't know what to pray as we ought, and it isn't that we don't know how to pray, if we don't know what to pray. There's no real wrong way to pray. A little child's prayer is just as right as the most sanctified saint. But sometimes we pray for the wrong things, as we'll talk about here shortly. But the Spirit himself make us, makes intercessions with groanings unspeakable, that is, unspeakable by human speech. And he who searches the heart, that's God, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for us according to God, it's according to what God wants. Now, I have personally found that it is powerful against sin to, to overcome the flesh by the, Spirit of the God, by the Spirit of God. If I, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of my body, I live. Amen. If I try it by my own New Year's resolutions or by my own willpower, I flop. Of course, you've got to make up your mind you want to do it. <laughs> but you won't do it in your own strength. Now, as we think about the Holy Spirit tonight, I would like to say that we must speak about the Holy Spirit in the language which the Spirit teaches, in the language of the Bible. Paul said, to the Corinthians, brothers, I have figuratively transferred to myself and to Apollos the things that I've been telling you, so that you might learn by us, by our example, you might learn this, not beyond what is written. In other words, you're to learn that lesson. That's written to Christians. And we ought to speak where the scriptures speak, and insofar as possible, it's not totally possible, be silent where the scriptures are silent. Alexander Camel wrote that for 25 years he had tried to get rid uh, from his vocabulary of all unbiblical expressions. <laughs> I think he was right. Now, Brother Blakely down here, he can't talk without quoting a scripture verse or uh, uh, saying scripture phrases. Hallelujah, we ought to all be talking like that. <laughs> Our vocabulary should be saturated with the words of the Spirit. That's true. I think Alexander Camel was doing the right thing when he did this. Now, in the light of that, I am uncomfortable with and avoid such expressions as original sin. Now, there was an original sin. I didn't do it. Now, if I'd have been there, I'd have done it. <laughs> But I don't like that expression. That's loaded with some ideas that might not be all right. I don't like the, I don't like the term total hereditary depravity. I'm going to talk about that. We got depravity, but it's not total. 
but some of it may be hereditary. Likewise, we never find any, any, in Scripture any prayers or songs which are spoken directly to the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's true. Amen. Now, we sang one tonight that sang to the Holy Spirit. You, did, you haven't sinned. But maybe you could do a little better. Usually, prayer is addressed directly to God. A few prayers are addressed directly to Jesus. You can probably count them on one hand. <laughs> it seems to be the particular ministry of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and deliver it to you. It seems to be the particular ministry of the Spirit to point to Jesus and exalt him, for God has given him all authority and made him Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings. Amen. And again, I'm not criticizing anybody's speech, but think about it. In this passage that I have uh, quoted, Romans 8, 26, 27, I basically see four things here. I see an almighty assister. A heavenly helper. Amen. And of course, that's the Spirit. It says here that likewise the Spirit helps our infirmity. Now, if it's likewise, what's it like? Well, it's like what he's been talking about in the preceding paragraph. And when you look at the paragraph just previous to these verses, uh, before 7, 26, and 27, you find there that Paul was talking about the future deliverance of the material creation from the death and decay and disintegration that now dominates it. That's what he's talking about. He speaks in this chapter about how that the whole creation is eagerly awaiting for the revelation of the sons of God. And the creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the, liberty, the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, he says that just like the marvel of what will happen when Jesus, what will happen when Jesus comes, like that great marvel, we now have a great marvel in, our, in the Lord helping our weakness in the same glorious way. Now that staggers my mind. I, I think about the resurrection of the dead as a wonderful thing. I like to go by the cemetery, and well, I don't like to go by cemeteries particularly, but you're bound to go by a few of them if you drive out on the road. Uh, but I like to shake my fist at the tombstones and say, them bones going to rise again. I like that. Uh, but uh, the dead shall be raised. Though we were buried in foul-smelling corruption, we are, we shall be raised in glory. Amen. Though we were buried in total weakness and disability, cancer, congestive heart failure, arthritis, though we were buried in weakness and disability, we shall be raised in power. Amen. <laughs> we shall be raised in glory. We now live in a natural body. We share in flesh and blood. But flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. When the Lord descends, we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And the body will not just be raised a natural body, but a spiritual body. Amen. Energized by the very Spirit of God. Amen. I don't know all these mysteries, but it sort of makes my spine crawl to, to think about these glorious promises. At that time, the heaven and earth will pass away with a great noise, boom! And uh, the works that are therein shall be burned up. Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Wherein righteousness dwells. And the material creation will, be, will become new. And the, cre the creation shall share in the glorious liberty of the children of God. First, we shall be trans transformed, and then the whole universe be transformed. Amen. We share the glorious liberty first, then the material creation follows Amen. it. That's wonderful. Amen. Now, in the, 
in an equally glorious way, we now can have deliverance even in this present flesh. Now this, this almost, as the teenagers say, blows my mind. Uh, there's almost too much here to handle. But we have a greater deliverance than most of us ever lay hold upon. In our church in North Joplin, we have a lady who has had so many afflictions, multiple personalities, marriage breakups. You, you cannot believe all the trouble that woman has had. And yet she is now one of the most sanctified people I've ever met. The Lord can transform people. But we have to lay hold upon his power. However, multitudes of people do not do not, a multitude of church people do not really have that joy. I took a little poll in the church and asked, are you really a happy person? <laughs> I, I said, now don't sign your name on this, be honest. <laughs> It'd be terrible to see who all my gloomy people were in the church when they signed their name onto it. But anyway, there were several people who said, no, I'm not really happy. I'm not happy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Say, I, can't be re I can't rejoice. I'm sick. I hurt. My children won't mind me. <laughs> I can't meet her bills. So on. I didn't win the lottery or something. But anyway, we can have a glorious victory if we will lay hold upon God's power. Now, a second thing I see in this passage, not only about our heavenly helper, our, mighty, our almighty sister, I see about our own wretched weakness. I use the term wretched advisedly because Paul used it in Romans 7, where after he spoke about how that he couldn't do the good he wanted to do, and he did the bad he didn't want to do. And he says, oh, wretched man. Uh, if Paul thought he was wretched, well, I expect some of us got a bit of wretch uh, in our Constitution. Uh, that's, that's sad but true. We are wretched because we're not subject to God's law. In Romans 8, uh, we're told in verses 5, five 6, and 7, those who live according to, their fl according to the flesh, now remember this is written to Christians, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. They're off at the picture show tonight instead of being here or something or they're home watching TV. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be? Uh, we, are, we are rebellious against God's law. We want to run our own lives. In our world, a garden left to itself, ever since Adam's sin, a garden left to itself produces a hurtful crop of thorns and brush, poison ivy, and you name it. <laughs> if you've neglected your yard or your lawn, why, you know what happens. Likewise, our human lives and our children's lives, if left to themselves, produce a crop of evil and sad things. That's the way it is in the world. Amen. It seems natural for even little children to retaliate and take revenge. I have a beautiful little blonde granddaughter in St. Louis. She's now five years old. When she was three, she was playing in the yard with a little playmate who was four. Her playmate took one of Sherilyn, my granddaughter's toys. Sherilyn went over to the side of the house where there was a broom. She picked up the broom and whacked the little kid over the head with the broom handle. <laughs> uh, I didn't know my beautiful little angel blonde granddaughter had it in her. <laughs> but uh, we've got some sinful weakness in it. The Bible doesn't define exactly the extent of that weakness, but there's some of it there. Uh, it, it seems natural to lie. You catch a kid in doing something wrong, and they lie. Somehow or other, you don't have to train them how to do it. I don't know. Uh, it seems natural to say, no, no, no. That seems to be one of the first words kids learn. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, 
uh, to uh, commands or even suggestions. I can do it myself. It seems natural to take whatever we like, which is another form of stealing. It seems natural for many humans, most humans, to have an excessive fascination with sex, even an obsession with it. That seems to be something that's almost inevitable. It becomes all they want to sing about or talk about. It seems natural in many people to want to hit people and hurt people, trip people and then laugh about it. Uh, we have sin in us. The Bible doesn't describe this sin in any particular analytical form, but boy, it's there. And sometimes I've asked, what's wrong with me? There are songs that they sing about this. There's an old country and western song. I don't have a guitar. It's a good thing. Oh, I was born the next of kin, the next of kin to the restless wind. Well, uh, I, basically, he was saying, I got this bad in me, and I can't change it, and don't try to change me. Uh, <laughs> I was born the next of kin to the restless wind. I saw a young lady who had a T-shirt on the other day, and on the front of it was written, born in a bad mood. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I saw another one had a shirt that said, uh, uh, I don't get mad, I get even. Well, I, uh, may the Lord deliver me from her clutches. Uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> and I talked to a fellow just last week, and he says uh, he was having trouble with alcohol, and he said, I was born bad. No, you're not born bad, but you've got that t tendency. Uh, you can be, uh, you can be uh, like a cultivated rose instead of a cucklebur. <laughs> uh, if you pull up the cucklebur and cultivate the roses. Though we, descendants of Adam, are born with serious weakness, we have not been cursed to the point that we cannot do anything good and can never resist sin victoriously. God told Cain, the son of Adam, when he was tempted to kill his brother Abel, God said, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. It's like a lion ready to pounce on you. Sin lies at your door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Our depravity in sin and weakness is great, but it is not a total depravity. We are still responsible for our own actions and accountable for them. God is not unjust to punish those who do evil. God doesn't say, you can't help it. You do evil because you're rotten, but I'm going to punish you for it anyway. I don't, I'm not telling God how to judge, but to me, that sounds like injustice. And God is just in however he just judges us. There have been a few good men like Job, of whom the Lord himself said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Hey, Satan, have you looked Job over? There's none like him on earth a blameless and an upright man. Twice God said that about Job. That was God's own analysis. A man who fears God and shuns evil. But people like Job with godly determination are few in number. Psalm 14, 2 and 3 says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. Sorry. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's none who does good, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have a great weakness, we really do. And uh, the uh, psalmist says, Lord, make me know my end, that I may know how frail I am. Amen. We cannot live according to the lust of the flesh. Amen. Romans 8, again, says, those who live according to the flesh and that's written to Christians, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Amen. We're not debtors. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Again, that's written to Christians. Amen. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. And I've really found it's a powerful thing to pray two things. Lord, I promised you that I would do right, and I didn't do it. Lord, 
I can't do it, but by your spirit, I want to do it. I'm going to do it, Lord. And I've also found it powerful to pray by the blood. Lord, Christ shed his blood on the cross. And I can overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. And if I pray by the spirit and by the blood, I've gained a lot of victories. Of course, I've lost some battles too because I'm still weak. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say, I have no sin, you deceive yourself. You don't know your own heart. We all have this terrible weakness. The apostle Peter wrote of those who have eyes full of adultery, who cannot cease from sinning. They entice unstable souls. Paul wrote to Titus and said that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Yeah. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the glorious hope and the great appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a very rotten world. The people of the world all around us are ruled by the lust of the flesh. In the Joplin Globe, Monday, July 12th, I don't know how long ago that's been, last week, I guess, there was the headline, Raunchy Comedies Rule the Box Office. And it said, Bye-bye, American Pie Tickets. That's what moviegoers did at the box office over the weekend. They spent $18.1 million in one week on a raunchy teenage comedy about a bunch of high school guys trying to lose their virginity by graduation day. I don't think any Christian should know that that kind of rot is what they're, what they're going to see and still go to it. I don't think they should. Amen. Abhor that which is evil. Amen. Abhor means to hate something bad enough you stay away from it. Another film, Big Daddy, which features Sandler and a little boy urinating in public and brutalizing rollerbladers in the park, that one earned $16 million the same week. Yet another film, raunchy and unapologetically obscene, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, has drawn critical raves. Well, the critics can rave all they want to. That doesn't make it good. I've always thought that anything that was so rotten and so bad that we wouldn't let our kids see it or drink it <laughs> is so rotten and bad that as adults we ought not to want to see it or drink it. Amen. Uh, why should adults be allowed to do sins that they won't let their kids do it? Kids can see through that hypocrisy and they, they do it. The same paper told of an organization of computer hackers that takes the name Cold of the Dead Cow. Only dead cows I ever was around. <clears throat> I wanted to get away. Um, these people have produced a computer virus program to attack Windows 95, 96, Windows NT. They do not love their neighbors as themselves. They don't love anybody. And the world is full of hate. Oh, brothers, abstain from every appearance of evil. One of the great writers in the history of the church, Augustine, or Augustine, as his name is often spelled, wrote the confessions about his life, the sins that he had experienced as he grew up. And I'm going to read now a little section from him. He's telling here about what he was like when he was around 14, 15, 16 years old. The thing that bothers me is that some of these same attitudes I have felt myself. I hope not quite as ornery as he was, but there are enough similarities that it makes me uncomfortable. Theft, Augustine wrote, is punished by thy law, O Lord, and by the law written in men's hearts, which iniquity itself cannot blot out. For what thief will suffer a thief? Yeah, don't steal from me. <laughs> what thief will suffer a thief? Even a rich thief will not suffer him who is driven to thievery by want. 
Yet I had a desire to commit robbery, and did so, compelled neither by hunger nor poverty, but through a distaste for well-doing and a lustiness for iniquity. For I pilfered that which I already had a sufficiency of, and much better. Nor did I enjoy, desire to enjoy what I had pilfered, but I enjoyed the theft and the sin itself. Oh, whew. There was a pear tree close to our vineyard, heavily laden with fruit, which was tempting neither for its color nor its flavor. To shake and rob this tree, some of us wanton young fellows went late one night, having, according to our disgraceful habit, prolonged our games in the streets till late at night, and carried away great loads of the pears, not to eat ourselves, but to fling at the hogs. <laughs> They're going to throw pears at the pigs. Having only eaten a few of them, and to do this pleased us all the more because it was not permitted. Behold my heart, O God, behold my heart, which thou hast had pity upon when in the bottomless pit. Behold now, let my heart tell thee what it was seeking there, that I should be gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil but the evil itself. It was foul, but I loved it. I loved to perish, I loved my own error, not that for which I erred, but the error itself. Well, we have a weakness. Have mercy upon me, O God, the psalmist wrote, for I am weak. I am weak. Well, we said we saw in this chapter the, uh, the heavenly helper, our almighty sister. We've seen our wretched weakness. And before I leave this thought of the wretched weakness, I have to quote you the last verse in the 8th chapter of Romans after Paul says oh wretched man who shall deliver me out of the body of this death he says I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord <laughs> I don't want to leave that one on a gloomy note no way thirdly in this, in this passage I see our incapacitating ignorance I hope I'm not showing off trying to come up with some alliteration here but I guess I am Lord deliver me from my vanity uh, anyway uh, you say you haven't got much to be vain about. That's true. Uh, but anyway, we do not know what we should pray as we ought. Now, he didn't say I, we don't know how to pray. He said we don't know what to pray. Often we pray ineffectively. We pray wrongly without realizing what we're doing. And with disappointment in God's response. 1 John 5, 14 says, Now this is the confidence which we have in him, and that if we ask anything, what? According to his will, he hears us. Certainly when we pray using Bible language, when we follow the model prayer of the Lord, and pray in scriptural language, certainly that's an acceptable prayer. <laughs> that's already the words of the Spirit. But often we don't know what we should pray as we ought. Why do we not know what we should pray for? Well, we don't know the secrets of other people's hearts. And we may pray wrongly about them. I have had people suspect me of having rotten motives that I didn't have at all. I've had people say, well, you think you're pretty cool, don't you? I didn't have that in my mind at all. We misjudge people. And it's so easy for human judgment to be much sterner than God's judgment. Humans would have killed Cain. God let him live. God is kinder than we are. And sometimes we pray harshly against people. Therefore judge nothing before the time when the Lord comes, when God will both bring to light the hidden things and of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. We also may pray wrongly in that we ourselves are guilty of doing the same things that we judge others for. <laughs> That's true. Now, Paul said, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. I don't even judge myself. I don't know anything against myself, but I'm not justified. And 
we don't know what to pray for as we ought because we don't have any idea what God's going to do in the future. Missionaries after missionaries have said, oh, God, get me on this boat, get me on this airplane. They couldn't do it. And then the thing went down or something or other, or a war broke out. Uh, we don't know what God's going to do in the future. So when we pray for something, God doesn't give it. That's, that's just beyond our power. We can all be deceived. Uh, Paul said that I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity and purity that is in Christ. Our minds can be corrupted. You say, well, I'm strong. Brethren, if a person be overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, or claim you're spiritual, what? Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself lest you also be tempted. I doubt that anybody who had a divorce ever got married expecting to have a divorce. I'm sure that many people who have taken other people's lives said, I never intended to do that. I've never thought about doing that. We can all be tempted, and multitudes of people have fallen into the very sins that they were preaching against. In fact, sometimes preaching against sin is almost a door to temptation uh, to get involved in it. And so uh, we have an incapacitating ignorance in our prayer life, but fourthly, we have an interpreting intercessor. <laughs> if we say something wrong, don't worry about it. I imagine the Holy Spirit smiles indulgently and said, uh, God, this is what he meant. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his words might have been wrong, but uh, Lord, though he doesn't know what to pray as he ought, I make this intercession for him in a language that maybe he doesn't understand, but you understand. Now, I have difficulty picturing this in my mind. Most often in the Bible, Christ is presented as the intercessor. That's very common. Romans 8, 34, it is Christ who died, furthermore is risen, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Now, because Christ came in the flesh, I picture him as having a fleshly body, which he did. And I can picture him going to the Father and praying for me. But because I can't see a spirit, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, and that impairs my ability to visualize them. <laughs> uh, because a spirit has not flesh and bones, I, I can't quite form a mental picture of the spirit making intercession for us, but that's okay. If I can't see it, I accept it. <laughs> I accept any help I can get. Happily. I need it all. And the thing which charms me about this is that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is also called the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And so any intercession that the Holy Spirit might make for me is the same kind of, in, in, the same kind of intercession that Christ would make for me. Amen. <laughs> Jesus and the Holy Spirit work for us as one in making us fully acceptable to God. <laughs> There's not one area of responsibility for the Spirit and one area of responsibility for Jesus. They join together to bring me glorious salvation. So thus, uh, I have an almighty a sister who helps me in my wretched weakness and my incapacitating ignorance with his interpretations and his divine intercession. And I say, hallelujah. God has given us all things necessary for life and godliness. But we've got to take hold of that power. If you, by the Spirit, crucify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. But as Brother Stoner said, if you live by the flesh, you will die. But why should you die? 